Hi folks, so buffer overflows. Buffer overflows are one of the most common security vulnerabilities. For many years they were the most, um, the, the cause of the most critical security vulnerabilities, only overtaken now by cross-site scripting. Still super common, they're insidious in that they're usually one-line programming mistakes. So by writing one line of um, bad code, you end up um, with a critical security vulnerability where an attacker can basically subvert the behavior of your program and you know take control of the program basically and run arbitrary code often. So buffer overflows are um, yeah important and kind of easy mistakes to make, which is part of the problem if you're using programming languages that are particularly prone to buffer overflows. So by today's standards, C is a fairly low level language. It exposes the complexity of the underlying system. So when you write C, it is close to the bare metal. It's a, it's a high level programming language in that you're using like if statements and loops and things like that. Um, but it's only one step away from the compiled assembly. When you finish with your C code, and if you want to, you can optimize C code by putting some lines of assembly in there as well, usually. Um, and then at the end of the day, you compile it and you end up with a bunch of machine code and it will run. And so you can write C code that can do basically, you can tell it to do basically anything. And if you tell it to do something that the CPU can't do when it tries to run the instruction, it will just crash your program. So, um, you know, compared to other programming languages, which take a lot of the responsibility away from the user and they'll protect you from making those kinds of mistakes. But C is still really commonly used. For example, uh, the entire um, uh, Linux kernel is written in C um, and a lot of, so a lot of system software is still written in C. Embedded software is often written in C because it's just faster because uh, it doesn't have as many layers of software and um, frameworks and things that are, that's going on. It, it just runs uh, just directly. There's no, it's not an interpreted language. It's compiled and you just run directly on the CPU. So, um, but it doesn't have all the security primitives that are built into like newer languages like Java, for example. So C was designed to be lightweight. It was actually designed in order to code the Unix operating system. So, um, you know, it's close in terms of the system calls to, um, and the same with like Linux system calls and things, is close to the interface of the C libraries, for example. Um, but yeah, unlike other languages like Java, C doesn't enforce sane data copying. The language itself will likely let a programmer ask for things that don't really make sense. So you can copy data into, a me into memory that's not been allocated yet. It will happily compile. Um, if you've got a really clever compiler, it might try and detect some of these problems, but it will compile, happily compile code for you that won't be able to run or it will crash when you do run it. Um, or it will do things that um, you don't expect it to do. So there's no enforced bounds checking. So for example, if you're copying something into a variable uh, and you happen to copy a bit too far, you'll just end up writing over whatever else is in memory next to it. So it doesn't enforce bounds checking compared to Java, for example, where you can only write to a variable um, in certain ways and it will not let you write outside the index of what the size of the thing is that you're copying into as a language or a framework. So that's known as type safety when it actually enforces things that are sane in terms of how variables are used. So C is, is an, not a type safe language or it's weakly a type safe language. It will, the compiler will stop you from doing things like trying to copy a string into a floating point, num uh, floating point number or something like that, um, or an integer. It will like stop you from doing some of those sorts of things. But when the program's running, you can access all the memory space directly. Like you can access the memory in a raw sense and you can, there's a lot of pointers involved in C programming. So a pointer is just like a variable that holds a memory address. Uh, and then you use that to access, you know, what's in memory. And you can do like pointer arithmetic. So you, you can loop through an array by adding to the 
to a pointer, for example, to find the next element and things like that. So you can do all kinds of kind of crazy things that might be allow you to optimize things to the nth degree. Um, but a programming language like Java, which is type safe, won't allow you to do anything that doesn't that it won't allow you to do. It's it's very specific about what's allowed to go into this variable, and if you want to put something into that variable, you have to cast and you have to you know, specifically say that you're trying to convert from one data type to another and stuff like that. So in C, um, there are quite a few complications with using strings. So strings like, like text data is super common, obviously. So programmers like often need to need to get input from users and whether that's by the command line or through a graphical interface or whatever it's most common that you know you're receiving strings so c doesn't actually have a string data type so instead what it actually uses is an array of characters so every string you can actually uh, uh, um it's basically just sitting in um like usually literally it's just a region of memory where you've got bytes that have ASCII characters in them. And from a programming perspective, it's just an array of string of um, characters. And so you can access each of the characters from within a string by looping through uh, the elements of the array, for example. So, you know, as you will probably be aware, an array is like a, is a variable that holds multiple values. And in C, they're all the same, uh, you know, the same data type. So there's, there are functions in C that are very unsafe to use. And I mentioned some of them along with the safer versions in the um, previous video. But get s or gets is never safe, um, but it is the most common way that you used to ask for input from a user. So if you look at um, code snippets on the internet, um, like on Stack Overflow and stuff, they might still Find, you might still find answers that have these insecure ways of reading input from a user. But it's never safe to use getS. Basically, as soon as you include that function in your program, your program is vulnerable to a buffer overflow. There's pretty much nothing you can do at that point. Um, all you have to do is include that one call to that function and you've got a vulnerable, a vulnerable program. So don't use getS. There's other things you can use instead. But it's just a good example because so you use get string and you say, oh, okay, I want to get input from the user and please store it in this memory address. Again, you pass that as a pointer and say, put it in here. Um, and then what the get s function does is it asks the user for some input and then just keeps reading the input from the user until they hit enter or hit or end a file. Um, it just keep reading in and overriding memory. And obviously, at first, it will overwrite the variable that you're trying to write into. And then it will just continue on overwriting everything else. So, um, which is obviously bad. So, the, so, yeah, it's important when you are copying that you only are copying into the intended variable that you're trying to actually put information into. And, but yeah, many standard C functions don't provide bounds checking. Um, and so, yeah, that's an example of, um, get s is an example of a vulnerable function that you should just never use. So in memory, so when you, um, so, you know, we've covered this elsewhere, I'll just quickly mention, when you start a program up, what it does is it, um, the kernel gives you each program a virtual address space, uh, which basically means that um, the addresses used within each program can ignore the fact that other programs exist. Each program gets its own bit of RAM that it gets to play with. Um, so it can use this virtual address space, but at first actually a lot of the addresses aren't actually allocated. So if a program tried to access some random bit of memory in its own virtual address space, if it's not actually allocated memory, the program just crashes. Um, so the kernel tracks the parts of the um, the address space that actually maps into RAM, and so you know the, that's where the program um, you know needs to manage memory, and you know you every program will have the actual code itself from the binary gets mapped in there, 
and then there's some other bits but two important bits I want to mention now is the stack and the heap. So you have the stack which is basically uh, it's like a static thing that well it kind of grows and shrinks and um, it kind of grows each time a new function is called and it shrinks every time the function ends. So it grows with and shrinks with the functions that are being called like methods um, that are being called within the, within the code and the heap is if um, you wanted in the while well, you're programming to have some more space to store something a bit bigger so for example you're about to open up a big document or something and you want to store that somewhere you wouldn't store all of that content within a stack because the stacks only actually allowed to grow to a certain size so you have to allocate memory on the heap and so you say to the kernel, give me some space. And the kernel says, yeah, okay, here you go. This is um, some space on the heap that you can use. Um, and then the program needs to manage that and free it when they're finished with the heap space, for example. So there are some important CPU registers, including registers that track the position of the stack, so the top and the bottom of the stack. Um, and um, there's also an important register that tracks what instruction is going to execute next. So it, um, the return address is stored on the stack and that um, return address gets fed into EIP which is a register which tells the CPU what to do next, where to jump, what code, where to get the code basically to execute next in terms of memory. Um, and so if it tries um, yeah, and so those things are sitting on the stack. So, um, so the, the call stack is this area of memory and it keeps track of program execution. Again, I know we've covered this elsewhere, but I'm just going to really quickly mention it because it's fundamental to understanding how buffer, stack smashing buffer overflows work. So when a function is called, a new stack frame gets added to the stack for that function. And inside that stack frame, it stores um, the return address, so where to jump to next um, when the function ends, and also local variables and parameters. So let's have a look at what that looks like. You've got the main function, and it calls Bazinga, calls bar, calls foo, and each time it calls a new one, there's a new stack frame that gets put onto the stack. And every time one of those ends, the way it knows where to jump to to get back to the one that called it is it uses the return pointer, which was stored within the stack. So when you write into adjacent memory, you can overwrite a data roaming attack, which will overwrite variables that are sitting in adjacent memory. And if you continue on, you'll eventually overwrite the return pointer. And that return pointer um, has the uh, potential to introduce more problems. But as soon as you overwrite that return pointer, uh, and that return pointer is then used to change the value in EIP, which is the next instruction to execute. That is known as a stack smashing buffer overflow attack. Um, if you're lucky, as the writer of the software, you'll discover while you're testing your program that it crashes with segmentation faults and you go, oh, I better fix that. Uh, if you are unlucky and an attacker is lucky, <clears throat> they'll find a long input to something you didn't expect and cause a buffer overflow. So as bug hunters will often be inputting long um, text into any chance that we get to test somewhere where you get to put some input in, <clears throat> try putting in something really big. Um, because if there's a buffer overflow and you get to overwrite the, um, the return address, and the program seg faults, then that's a huge red flag that you've probably found yourself a buffer overflow, a stack smashing buffer overflow vulnerability. So, the as the pro, as the um, program is executing, there's a whole bunch of um, registers that are used for temporary data stores and things like that, but there are some that are used for specific purposes, um, and that includes the EBP which is the frame or base pointer. So that's the bottom of the current stack frame. There's the ESP, which is the stack pointer, which is the top of the current stack frame. So that's like the top of the stack. Uh, 
and there's the EIP, which is the address of the next instruction. That gets retrieved from the return address, which is stored on the stack. So when the, pro when the function ends, so that it knows what to do next, it loads that return address back into EIP, and then the CPU will, looks at EIP and it tells it what the next thing is, that it, what the next um, instruction is that it should execute. And if that instruction is unallocated memory, program crashes, uh, which is usually the case if you just do something random, um, but if you have carefully, um, if you're carrying out an attack, what you're aiming to do is to point EIP somewhere where you've got some code that you want to execute. So if we're careful and we craft some input, we can actually make the program jump to somewhere else, either in its own logic, known as arc injection, or um, direct injection to jump into our shell code to actually um, execute our, um, our code. So we enter code that starts a shell and um, point the return address at our code. So that's, at, you know, when we're trying to exploit a vulnerability, uh, that's usually what we want to do. We want to put some shell code, you know, in an ideal world, we put some shell code in, into the buffer and then we um, point the return address at that so that, the, so that our shell code gets executed. So this is what it looks like. You've got a buffer and you're writing into it. Uh, if everything was going well, like nothing went, if buffer overflows didn't exist, we would just be writing within the buffer, within the actual variable that's been declared for us to write into. But with, um, you know, when there's not the adequate bounds checking, and then we keep writing, what we end up doing is writing over local variables. And then if we go far enough, we'll re go over the return address and eventually over um, the parameters and things as well. So in an ideal world, what we might do is kind of put our shell code into the buffer and as part of the input that we're putting in, we override a bunch of stuff with some junk. It doesn't really matter what else is there. And then on the return address, we point it at the shell code. You know, potentially is one way um, to do it. Or it might be the other way around. It might be that the shell code sits on the other side of the return address. So we might have uh, buffer, local variables, return address, uh, and then the shell code, and we somehow point it to that. However, it's never as simple as this, it, never. Um, um, for the most basic reason being that the stack will change depending on the order of events that's happened with the program. So at a bare minimum, we won't know the exact address of our shellcode. So at a bare minimum, and this is ignoring some, uh, miti some of mitigations that exist. But at a minimum, the stack's gonna move around a little bit. So, so yeah, so we're gonna need to do something a little bit different. Um, so the, remember we've got the EVP, um, which is the bottom of the stack, ASP, which is the top of the stack, um, stock for stack frame, and the EIP, which is the address of the um, next instruction. So we can see here some example code of kind of where the stack, you've got the, the stack, um, you know, as you will, uh, um, be trying to wrap your heads around from, you know, when we've covered the stack um, previously, the stack is actually growing down. Um, and so, you know, to understand those previous examples, you actually have to kind of like flip them upside down because the stack is actually growing in this direction. So the, the direction of the addresses um, is, um, yeah, it's, it grows, it grows downwards. So, um, you know, the addresses get higher as you, as you build on to the stack. So, um, what we need to do, um, instead, because we don't know the actual address, because we're in the stack and the stack moves around a little bit, what we need to do is have a jump instruction that we can use to um, get to our shellcode. So what this usually means is we look at some um, 
we look at some code that exists within the program, within the program's memory. Um, I mentioned that the program includes the binary code of the program itself, but also includes any libraries that have also been mapped into that um, virtual address space. Um, but so within any of that, if we can find a jump instruction, and we can also find a register that happens to be pointing at um, a um, into our buffer, if we can find a a, um, a register that has that contains an address that points into the middle, um, which is often the um, EBP, um, then what you can do is basically jump to the location of the jump instruction instead. So what you do is you um, overwrite, so our buffer will include um, the shell code. It'll include some NOP instructions, no operations, which will basically do nothing. Um, and then we'll overwrite our local variables. And then we'll carefully place onto the return address uh, the address of a jump instruction. So then what it will do is it um, the next, it pulls off the stack that value, which will be a um, value that points somewhere in memory within the program code itself. Um, you, you know, basically, you look through the code that's there, and it might be in the library or it might be in the program binary itself um, for that jump instruction. And then you, so you basically, on the return address, you say, okay, go here. And then when it when e, EIP is loaded up, it goes to um, that spot in memory, and then, then it um, hits onto the jump EVP, which will basically again it will just jump to somewhere else. It will jump to wherever EVP happens to be pointing, which can be our shell code, uh, or into an onto our NOP sled. So it, as long as we land somewhere on that, um, you know, in those no no operations. We got to slide down onto our shellcode, and our shellcode can execute. So very cool. So um, I think I'll stop there. I'm going to record a separate video giving an overview of writing exploits.